We are nearing the end of the Easter season. Next week we will celebrate Ascension Sunday, which is the last week of Eastertide. And the following week is Pentecost, when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. The scripture passage for today is fitting, I think, as we are in the time between Jesus' resurrection and the anticipation of the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is fitting, as we have been celebrating our relationships as Easter people during the current sermon series. It is fitting because Jesus... It is Jesus assuring the disciples that they would not be left alone. This passage takes place in what is known as the farewell discourse in John's Gospel. They come from the words that Jesus imparted to his disciples on the night before he was crucified. They were worried. They didn't know what was about to happen Jesus was talking about leaving them, about dying. Worries and fears swirled around them. Would they be killed too? How could they continue doing their ministry without him? There was still so much to learn. He was their leader, their teacher, their friend. There was still so much they didn't understand. They couldn't imagine being without Jesus, and Jesus gave them hope. He gave them words to live by and encouragement. He gave them the promise of the Holy Spirit. They could have hope because of Christ, because what he would do for them over those next few days, and because of the promises that he made to them. As Easter people, we are claiming that hope. We are claiming a life beyond the discovery of the empty tomb. This requires faith. The disciples saw Jesus. They knew him, and so they could believe because of what they had seen. We are called to believe even though we have not seen. We are called to believe through our relationship with Christ as revealed by the Holy Spirit. In our text for today, Jesus tells the disciples, God will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This verse is particularly interesting for two reasons. The first reason is that Jesus uses the term advocate from the Greek word parakletos. This word can mean advocate, helper, comforter, and advisor. Paraclete is not the usual term for Holy Spirit. We usually use the word pneuma, which means spirit, breath, or wind. But paraclete makes sense to use when referring to the Holy Spirit, because that is one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit, to be our helper, to be our advocate, to be the one who walks beside us. The Holy Spirit inspires us to do good works, to respond to our faith and love of God, and to seek God's will. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to live responsibly in the world. And people are led by the Holy Spirit to understand how God wants them to live and act. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we are to stand up for those who do not have a voice in society and to give as able to those less fortunate. The second reason this verse is particularly interesting is that Jesus says that God will give them another advocate. This reminds us that Jesus was also our advocate. He came to help us. He came to support us. He came to care for us. 
and we, in turn, are to be advocates for others. What does it mean to be an advocate? An advocate is a person who publicly supports another. An advocate is a person who speaks on someone else's behalf. We think of people needing an advocate in the hospital, someone who will speak up for the person who is sick, someone who will listen and pay attention to what the doctors and nurses are saying, someone who will speak up to make sure that the patient is getting the very best care. But there are lots of reasons why people need advocates, not only in hospitals. We need advocates. We need people who will stand by us and support us. Who is advocating for you? We need advocates, and we need to be advocates. There are numerous people in society who do not have as strong a voice as others. Children's voices are often not heard as loudly, and so we must be their advocates. We must speak up when there is injustice against those who cannot speak as loudly. We must serve as advocates, following the example of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We have hope because of Christ. Because we know the promise of Jesus and we know that there is life beyond the empty tomb. This hope liberates us and in turn we follow Christ's commands. In verse 15 of today's passage, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. The early hearers and we know what he was referring to. The verse, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are to love God and love people. It's both as simple and as difficult as that. We love people by showing compassion and striving for justice for all people. We love people by working to overcome discrimination and suffering. We love people by advocating for them. We love people by making sure that people are cared for. As I was preparing for the sermon this week, scholar Winnie Varghese posed a, posed a question that struck me. She asked, what would our community and our world look like if we saw every breath we took as immersing ourselves in God and every exhaling as an opportunity to breathe God's liberating love back out into the world? I love the way she phrases this question. She is taking from the ancient prayer practices of the desert mothers and fathers, a group of Christians in the 3rd through 5th centuries CE who lived in Egypt. They were monks, nuns, and aesthetics, devoting their lives to following God. They are believed to have developed the breath prayer where they would consider a phrase from scripture, breathing in while contemplating the first half, and then breathing out while considering the second. And they would repeat this action for extended periods of time. Others have taken up the practice as a way of praying without ceasing, as we are instructed to do in 1 Thessalonians. A saint from the same time period, John Chrysostom, used this prayer practice, primarily using the words based on Luke 18, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. In her question to us, Varghese connects action in the world with the work of the Holy Spirit by connecting these ideas through breath and air. 
Remember, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma, which also means breath. So she asks us to consider prayer and action hand in hand as we breathe in the support of the Holy Spirit and breathe out God's love as demonstrated by our call to action in the world. As you go throughout your week, I invite you to try the breath prayer. Find a verse that is particularly meaningful and breathe in as you consider the first half and breathe out as you consider the second half. Not all of you will find that it is a prayer practice that speaks to you, but for some of you it may become a meaningful way to slow down and breathe in the presence of God. And then consider Jesus' call to action, to exhale the love of God to all people, to worship God and advocate for people, to rest in the arms of the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, so that you can go out into the world to promote compassion and justice. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.